Welcome to this presentation. This will be a lecture on delirium. We shall be covering these aspects during this presentation. At the end, we will go through five self-assessment MCQs based on the presentation. Some information about myself. I am a consultant psychiatrist based in Chennai, a city in southern India. I have worked for many years in the United Kingdom. Delirium is an organic mental disorder. The word delirium is derived from Latin and it means off the track. Delirium is also called acute confusional state or organic brain syndrome. Delirium is characterized by confusion or disorientation. There is other cognitive impairment usually of attention and memory. Perceptual disturbances such as visual hallucinations are also common. Circadian rhythm disturbances such as insomnia also frequently occur. Delirium is characterized by an acute onset. It starts in a matter of hours to days and symptoms fluctuate during the course of the same day. Typically, symptoms are worse during the evenings and nights. In the etiology of delirium, it is useful to divide the factors into predisposing factors and precipitating factors. Predisposing factors are the three existing risk factors in the patient that makes the patient vulnerable to delirium. Precipitating factors are the factors that are immediately responsible for an episode of delirium. So, in the presence of multiple predisposing factors, even a single precipitating factor may be enough to result in delirium, whereas in the absence of any predisposing factor, even multiple precipitating factors may not result in delirium. So what are the predisposing risk factors for delirium? Age above, the, above 65 years, past history of delirium, cognitive impairment such as dementia or even mild cognitive impairment, other pre-existing brain damage such as stroke or TIA, sensory impairment in the form of blindness or deafness, multiple comorbid physical illnesses, admission for a major medical illness to the ICU, admission for fracture of his hip especially in the post-operative period, poorly controlled pain, history of alcohol abuse. What are the precipitating factors for delirium? Prescribed medication, especially when several drugs are prescribed. These include anticholinergics, anesthetics, psychotropics, steroids and opiates. Abuse of illicit substances, for example, cocaine, amphetamine. Withdrawal from substances such as alcohol or benzodiazepines. Acute vitamin deficiency, for example, acute thiamine deficiency can result in Wernicke's encephalopathy, which is characterized by delirium. Excessive use of physical restraints routinely 
in elderly patients can result in delirium. So restraints should be used judiciously. What are the other precipitating factors? So a range of medical conditions can result in delirium. Infections, typically pneumonia and UTI. High fever, metabolic disturbances, endocrine abnormalities, glucose imbalance, temperature changes, hypoxia, systemic diseases such as renal, hepatic or respiratory failure. Medical emergencies can also masquerade as delirium. For example, a myocardial infarction in a 90-year-old may present as uh, confusion or delirium and chest pain may not be prominent. Malignancies Studies have shown a high prevalence of delirium in the following medical settings. In geriatric patients, whether geriatric patients attending a &E or patients who are uh, admitted to inpatient units, patients admitted to intensive care units, patients in post-operative wards, typically elderly patients who have had hip replacement surgery, Palliative care units, what is the pathophysiology of delirium? The exact mechanism or mechanisms have not been well established. It is possible that multiple factors are involved. The postulated mechanisms include neurotransmitter imbalance, typically dopamine excess or cholinergic deficiency. So support for this comes from the fact that anticholinergics can precipitate delirium and dopamine antagonists like antipsychotics can improve symptoms of delirium. Inflammatory processes mediated by cytokines like interferons and interleukins reduce cerebral blood perfusion, psychological stressors that result in increased cortisol. Genetic vulnerability, for example, mutations in the APOE4 or dopamine transporter genes may be a risk factor. Delirium can broadly be divided into hyperactive and hypoactive types. Hyperactive delirium is characterized by agitation, restlessness and aggression and this is the type that is worse in the evenings and at night. Hypoactive delirium is characterized by retardation and the patient appearing withdrawn and sleepy. It may be misdiagnosed as depression and compared to the hyperactive subtype, hypoactive delirium has a worse prognosis as enough attention may not be given. As the saying goes, it's the squeaky wheel which gets the oil. And mixed type is where the patient fluctuates between hyperactive and hypoactive delirium, even during the same episode. Delirium is an organic disorder that is usually managed by a general physician or ICU physician. Psychiatrists can assist in advising about the use of psychotropic medication to manage behavioral and psychological symptoms of delirium. Psychiatrists can also help clarify the diagnosis if the patient has a history of mental illness or dementia. The main psychiatric differential diagnosis for delirium is dementia, particularly dementia with Lewy bodies. It is uh, important to note that delirium and dementia frequently co-occur. 
and dementia patients are at higher risk of delirium and delirium is associated with the risk of future persisting cognitive impairment. Occasionally, acute severe episodes of psychotic or mood disorders may present like delirium. However, cognition is not usually as severely impaired in these disorders as it is in delirium and the symptoms do not fluctuate that much and that quickly as they do in delirium. In postpartum psychosis, compared to psychosis occurring at other times, uh, the patient might appear confused. And in this slide, I have highlighted the key distinguishing features between dementia and delirium. If you want, you can pause at this slide and note down the points. So in the assessment of a patient who seems to be presenting with delirium, it is important to obtain history from a reliable informant who knew the patient well just prior to this episode of delirium. So typically that person would be the patient's spouse if the patient is coming from home or a ward nurse who has been looking after the patient for the last few days in hospital or if the patient is a resident in a nursing home, the primary carer from the nursing home. So these people would be able to tell you about the baseline functioning and presentation of the patient. It's important to do a thorough medical examination. Cognitive assessment is crucial in the diagnosis of delirium. Even simple tests of orientation and attention can be useful. The most widely used formal scale for delirium is the Confusion Assessment Method or CAM. I have listed a few other tests that can be useful. If needed, a psychiatric referral should be done. So the CAM assesses four features, acute onset and fluctuating course, inattention, disorganized thinking, and altered level of consciousness. For a diagnosis of delirium, features one and two namely acute onset and fluctuating course and inattention should both be present along with at least one of either three or four. A version for use in the ICU called CAM ICU is also available. So patients who cannot speak, for example, because they are being ventilated in the ICU, they can respond by squeezing the examiner's fingers or nodding or shaking their head, etc. A simple but systematic assessment and examination may avoid the need for unnecessary tests which can further cause discomfort for the patient. So take a full medication history, especially inquire about any recently started drugs or any dose changes that have been made recently. Also ask about over-the-counter medicines and complementary or herbal medicines. It's important to perform a thorough general, including neurological examination. Look for signs of dehydration. Check for any focus of infection, including in the abdomen. Examine for deep vein thrombosis, especially in post-operative patients. Ask the patient or preferably an, an informer about any sensory impairments. Record the vital signs and do a pulse oximetry. 
assess for urinary retention or constipation, check uh, a finger stick blood glucose, So tailor the investigations according to the needs of the patient. In some cases, the cause may be immediately obvious. For example, the delirium started after a first dose of an anticholinergic. So in these cases, stopping the offending agent may be the only measure that needs to be taken without the need for any tests. So I have listed some of the investigations that may be required in a patient with delirium. And these are few more of the investigations that can be done if the cause is still not clear. It is important not to do all the investigations in every patient. For example, a CT or MRI of the brain is not routinely needed for a patient with delirium. But if there is a history of fall or head injury, or if there are any focal neurological signs, then a CT or MRI would be useful. Similarly, a lumbar puncture should be done if subarachnoid hemorrhage or encephalitis or meningitis are suspected. EEG may be useful in delirium in both the hyperactive and the hypoactive subtypes. EEG shows diffuse slowing and an increase in uh, theta and delta slow waves. As far as the management of delirium is concerned, if a specific cause is identified as being responsible for the present episode of delirium, treatment of that cause would help resolve the delirium. If the cause is not clear or if it is going to take time for the cause to be treated, for example, a significant infection that needs a course of antibiotics, then additional measures both non-pharmacological and pharmacological may have a role. So in this slide, I have listed some uh, general measures that can help. So ensuring adequate hydration, satisfactory pain relief, Ensure adequate lighting during the daytime to restore circadian rhythm. Avoid moving the patient to different rooms or wards unless necessary as this can disorient the patient. Prominently displayed clock and calendar that the patient can see. Minimize noise. Avoid procedures such as catheterization or IV line when the patient is asleep at night. It is better to do these routine planned procedures in the daytime. Frequently reorient the patient by reminding them where they are, who you are, what your role is in managing the patient, etc. Facilitate visits from family and friends. Encourage the patient to read the newspaper, watch television news, etc. if possible. If the patient normally needs spectacles or hearing aids or dentures, make them available. You can use restraints for protection, but do not use them routinely. Use them only if needed, for example, if the patient is agitated. Avoid unnecessary medication.
psychotropics that are used frequently in delirium include first generation or typical antipsychotics, particularly haloperidol, second generation or atypical antipsychotics, and benzodiazepines. The general principle is to prescribe the lowest effective dose of any drug that is needed. So start low and if you want to increase, do the increase slowly. And this is especially important in the elderly. And you should use antipsychotics or psychotropics only if necessary. So examples of some scenarios in which psychotropics may be useful. A patient with severe agitation who is preventing necessary treatment, for example dialysis from being given, or a patient exhibiting unpredictable behavior with the potential risk of harm to oneself or to others or to ward property, a patient who is extremely distressed because of psychotic symptoms like visual hallucinations. So advantages of haloperidol include lower anticholinergic activity compared to some of the other older antipsychotics. Anticholinergic activity can worsen confusion. It has a lower risk of postural hypotension compared to chlorpromazine. And haloperidol can be given both orally and parenterally. However, it also has some disadvantages. It can cause acute extrapyramidal side effects like akathisia and dystonia. Haloperidol can result in QT prolongation on ECG, which can predispose to potentially fatal ventricular arrhythmia called torsade D points. Atypical antipsychotics may be as effective as haloperidol, but with a better side effect profile, especially when used short term. It is important to use much lower doses than those used for functional psychotic illnesses like schizophrenia. Uh, some of the commonly used atypical antipsychotics in delirium are olanzapine, risperidone and quetiapine. Benzodiazepines are generally not used first line in delirium. They can be used as adjunct to antipsychotics in severe cases or as an alternative to antipsychotics in those who develop side effects from antipsychotics or for whom antipsychotics are contraindicated. Benzodiazepines are however the primary treatment for alcohol withdrawal delirium tremens and also for delirium precipitated by benzodiazepine withdrawal in someone who has been using a benzodiazepine for many years. Potential disadvantages, disadvantages of benzodiazepines include risk of falls, a paradoxical increase in aggression and respiratory depression. They can also cause cognitive side effects. In this slide, I have uh, listed some of the commonly used benzodiazepines along with uh, the trade name. And uh, benzodiazepines uh, differ from each other uh, in terms of uh, pharmacological properties like uh, half-life. So you need to choose the benzodiazepine depending on the clinical situation. A longer acting benzodiazepine like diazepam or chlordiazepoxide is usually used for planned alcohol detoxification in a patient with a history of alcohol dependence to prevent delirium tremens or seizures. In such patients, uh, the dose of uh, the benzodiazepine is gradually reduced over a period of 5 to 7 days and then stopped. A shorter acting drug like lorazepam may be more useful for immediate control of agitation in a patient with uh, delirium.
While antipsychotics and benzodiazepines are commonly used in delirium, it is important to recognize that the evidence base for their effectiveness is not strong. It is possible that these drugs may only be effective in reducing symptoms but may not be able to alter long-term prognosis. It is even possible that they may actually convert hyperactive delirium to hypoactive delirium, which as we saw earlier has a poorer prognosis. So it is extremely important that clinicians use these drugs only if needed and only after exhausting simple non-pharmacological measures. In this slide, I have listed some of the other drugs that have been studied in clinical trials of delirium. Cholinesterase inhibitors like rivastigmine and donepezil, melatonin, ketamine, clonidine, and opiates. We will briefly talk about the HELP program. HELP stands for Hospital Elder Life Program. HELP is a non-pharmacological multi-component intervention that has been shown in many studies to be effective in either preventing or in managing delirium. Some of the components that are part of the HELP program include reorienting the patient regularly, ensuring hydration and nutrition, promoting sleep, early mobilization after surgery, ensuring that the patient has hearing or visual aids if needed. Delirium usually resolves within two weeks. However, when compared to patients who do not develop delirium, patients who have developed delirium, they experience longer stay in hospital, higher morbidity and increased rates of institutionalization, higher mortality both in hospital and up to one year after discharge. And there is also, as mentioned earlier, a future risk of persisting cognitive impairment. Hypoactive subtype of delirium may have a worse prognosis as the delirium is likely to be missed initially. So before we finish, we will go through a set of five multiple choice questions. Question 1. Which of the following is not a well recognized risk factor for delirium? Is it A. Delusional disorder, B. Dementia, C. Drug misuse or D. Drug withdrawal? We see a lot of Ds, delirium, delusion, dementia, drug misuse and drug mis withdrawal. If you want, you can pause and choose your option. And the correct answer is, it's not D, it is A, delusional disorder. So the other three are recognized risk factors for delirium. Question 2, which of the following is true? regarding the use of psychotropic medication in delirium. So if you want, you can pause, go through the options and choose your choice. And the correct answer is D. Benzodiazepines are the drugs of choice for delirium tremens. Option A is not true because you should not give high doses. Option B is not true because haloperidol is the most widely used typical antipsychotic. And option 3 is also not true because antipsychotics are not, atypical antipsychotics are not contraindicated, but you should use them judiciously. Question 3. Which of the following is not an essential feature required for a diagnosis of dementia by the CAM or confusion assessment method? If you want, you can pause and select your choice. And the correct answer is... B. B is not an essential feature 
whereas A and C are essential features. Both A and C are required. Question 4. Which of the following types of dementia is characterized by fluctuations in alertness and attention and so may be misdiagnosed as delirium? If you want, you can pause and select your option. And the correct answer is B. Dementia with Lewy bodies. And the final question. Which of the following is a feature of hypoactive delirium compared to hyperactive delirium? If you want, you can pause and select your choice. And the correct answer is C. Hypoactive delirium is associated with a poorer prognosis. And it is usually diagnosed later. And it generally requires a lower dose of psychotropics. And that brings us to the end of this presentation. Thank you for watching. Hope you found the presentation useful.